Good morning. morning. Welcome to the house of our God this morning. This uh, nice, warm, summery kind of day, I guess. Um, Do any of you have any uh, joys or concerns or announcements that you want to share with the congregation this morning? All right. Um, I have a couple, uh, and they're both... Uh, sort of, well, two or three, they're all sort of worship-related announcements. Um, the first of is which, uh, something that many of you ha- have discovered on the way in, is that the offering plate is no longer in the back of the sanctuary. Um, we are returning uh, this morning to a, a sort of more normalish pre-COVID sort of service order. So we're incorporating the offering as a part of the worship service uh, again and, and doing our, our song of thanksgiving and all of that. Uh, we're still not going to pass the plate, however. Uh, so what, during the offer time, I'm going to invite you to come and bring your offering forward and put it in the plate. And you can do the penny offering and the, the regular offering at the same time. You can give your offering to somebody else and one person can bring like four different peoples. That, that part doesn't really matter. But just have the act of offering, the act of giving as a, a part of our worship experience uh, once again, um, as a part of the, the life of faith uh, for us. So during that time, during the offering, uh, I ask you to bring your offerings forward and put them in the plate, uh, and then we'll sing our song of thanksgiving and our prayer of thanksgiving um, as we used to do back in the day. Um, the other thing is um, <clears throat> communion this morning. Communion will be, uh, we will be celebrating communion in the same uh, sort of way that we have been for the past little while. We're not going to pass the plates, but we will distribute elements to you, both elements to you, and then we will take them together um, one at a time after. Uh, so we'll do our best to get to each of you. Um, and since we don't have the pass-through pews anymore, you don't know you don't have to, it's fine. Um, we'll do our best. We'll get the job done. We're highly capable individuals. Um, and the last thing is about greeting time. 
Uh, last week we had a little sneak peek of it, but this week I'm also going to let you. I'm going to let you move around to greet one another. The key part of that is the responsible part is to greet people in the name of Christ in the way that they wish to be greeted. So if somebody doesn't want to shake your hand, don't force them to shake your hand. If they want to sit right where they're at, that's fine. Let them sit. Wave to them from a distance. So it's about greeting people in the way that the other, the person you're greeting is comfortable with. Okay? So, but as much as you're comfortable, greet one another. When it's time, not right now. All right? I think that's everything. Our sentences this morning come from Psalm 134. It's the entire psalm, all three verses. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Lord our God, we gather before you this morning in this place to worship you, to hear your word proclaimed, to be refreshed and renewed by the company of believers and by the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Lord, we pray that in this time of worship, your Holy Spirit would move in us and among us and through us, teaching us and challenging us and comforting us in this time of worship. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to stand and to greet one another this morning in the name of Christ as you want to be greeted. Our song of praise this morning is Open Our Eyes, Lord. The words will be on the screen. Will you please stand and join together in song?
seated. I forgot to mention our standing stuff are back too. Uh, as we join our hearts in a prayer of confession this morning, I invite you to respond to the words, Merciful God, forgive us by saying, and lead us in your ways. Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Lord our God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. Therefore, we pray in silence, confessing our individual sins before you. Merciful God, forgive us. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Merciful God, forgive us. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Merciful God, forgive us. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our words of assurance this morning come from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Brothers and sisters, believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. Join me once again in prayer as we prepare to open God's word together this morning. Holy Spirit, open our eyes and our ears that we may see and hear. Open our hearts and our minds that we may know and understand that which you have to speak to us this morning. And then, Lord, enable our hands and our feet and our mouths that we may go and do and proclaim all that you have spoken. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 10. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables 
is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is the word of the Lord. To God. You may be seated. So this summer we're talking about parables, and it seemed fitting somewhere towards the beginning to talk about this uh, passage where Jesus explains why he teaches in parables in the first place. Um, and I'm going to teach you what I presume is a new word for your vocabulary this morning. If you're looking, if some of you are probably looking at that thing on the screen and thinking, is that even a word? It is a word. And the word is obfuscation or obfuscation. And it's a word that I learned from these guys. These are uh, Ray and Tom Magliozzi. Uh, and they were uh, the hosts of a, a radio show for like 30 years called Car Talk. Any of you ever heard Car Talk? Click and clack. Here, here, this is what. Ha! We're back. You're listening to Car Talk with us, Click and Clack, the Tappert Brothers, and we're here to discuss cars, car repair, and the, the new puzzler. Oh, wow. That's Tom. Every week on the show, except in the summer when it takes a vacation, they have a puzzler. <clears throat> And a puzzler is just basically a, you know, it's a riddle, or it's a, a, something you have to figure out. It's a, a mystery that needs to be solved. Uh, and you can, you know, write in and win a, a gift certificate or something if you're the one that's, that's right. And the, uh, the puzzler could be automotive, or it could be historical, or it could be mathematical, or it could be semi, any of those things. Um, but they, they tell this, this, they give this puzzler, this thing that you're supposed to figure out and then let them know. And if, if Tom thinks that the, sometimes these puzzlers are submitted by other people. Uh, in fact, I was listening to one on the way down here this morning, submitted by somebody, and obfuscation, they use the word obfuscation, um, because they, they're retired and the show's no longer happening, but there's podcasts that you can listen to. They put a best of car talk off every week. Um, <clears throat> but if, if the puzzler that's submitted, if Tom thinks it's a little too easy to figure out, um, then he makes it harder, changes some of the details or leaves out certain parts that would give it away. Uh, and this is what <clears throat> Tom and Ray define as obfuscation. Um, he ta- he ob- obfuscates the puzzler. Um, basically, obfuscation is sort of like a, a, a thick fog or murky water or that guy's head that's directly in front of you so that you can't see what's happening on the stage, even though that's what you want to see, that's what obfuscation is about. Obfuscation is, is making it more difficult to see or to understand. It's to confuse it or to make something a little less clear um, so that it's, it's not so easily figured out. Uh, and this is a, a word and a concept that I learned from these two guys on their radio show. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I think one of the first times I heard it, it there was a, uh, a group of like high school students, a high school class whose teacher made them listen to Car Talk, and they were complaining about how big the vo- their vocabulary was on this show, and that he, wa- he was always an English teacher and always making them look up words, vocabulary words, that the two of them used on their radio show, and one of them was obfuscation. <clears throat> and so I learned a new word. And this is, this is Tom and Ray's strategy to ensure that the puzzler isn't too easy to figure out. 
Now, the thing about obfuscation is, and the thing about this strategy that these guys use for their puzzlers on their radio show, is that it's the same strategy that Jesus employs when he's teaching about or teaching through parables. This is what Jesus says why he teaches in parables. It's his his explicit reason for why he teaches in parables when he's asked. In Matthew chapter 13, we are in the middle of a series of a collection of parables, uh, where there's just sort of one right after the other. And in some of the cases we have uh, Jesus, what follows directly after this is Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower, what it means. Um, but the parables, you will find the parable of the sower here, the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast, the parable of the wheats and the tares. I think we'll return to Matthew 13 at least once over the course of the summer. Um, cause there's just a whole lot of parables here. Uh, and in the middle, well, towards the beginning of this section here, um, verse 10 uh, through 17, the disciples decide they're going to ask the question. Uh, Master, why do you teach in parables? And Jesus gives an answer which, is, um, which he quotes from the prophet Isaiah and says basically the reason I, I speak to them in parables is so that they won't understand what I'm talking about. I am obfuscating my message so that they won't be able to understand it too easily. Now most of us would prefer, because we're, um, our culture is rooted in Greek philosophy, most of us would prefer if Jesus would just, you know, just tell us straight out. Can you just explain it to me simply and be direct? Give me an, a list of instructions or directions that I can follow and just just tell me straight, please. None of this story stuff. I have to work hard for that to figure it out. Just tell me. And most of us would prefer that. We prefer direct instruction to the sort of circuitous sort of getting around to it sort of you have to figure out what my meaning is and what I really want you to do, right? If you just tell them straight out. But that's not what Jesus does here. That's not what a parable is about. A parable isn't direct instruction. We don't get really a lot, a lot of that from Jesus, uh, in fact. Jesus' teaching method His preaching method is one in which he tells stories and he asks you to figure out what it is you think you want him to say. He's really tricky that way. He always answers a question with a question. Turns it around on the person asking the question, usually. Not so in this case, because it's disciples. You do have moments in the New Testament where Jesus is is crystal clear. And just coming up after this, he explains a parable that he that he's just told to the people, but he explains it to his disciples, not to the general public. He only dis- explains the parable to the people who are following him, to her, who are his trusted uh, disciples. And he says to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. They haven't been given to know. And he quotes this passage from Isaiah about uh, the people of God being unable or unwilling to see and unwilling to hear. And they don't understand. Uh, Because if they did, they would turn. And then he would heal them. Jesus' response to the question, why do you teach in parables, is essentially, the short version, So not everybody understands what I'm saying. I teach this way so that not everybody understands. One of the commentators that I read, or one of the the notes on this passage that I read this week, said, uh, there's no real way to soften what Jesus says here. There's no way to soften that Jesus says that he is teaching in this particular way in order that people will not understand. It 
Jesus intentionally obfuscates his teaching so that people don't understand it. And the, the question that it raises for me, um, and which I then will raise for each of you, is what does this say about the character of Jesus? What does it say about the character of Jesus that he teaches people in such a way with the intentional purpose that not all of them will understand? What does it say about the nature of salvation? Because this is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the essence of salvation. What does it say about the nature of salvation that that Jesus teaches and preaches in such a way so that not everyone will understand what it is that he's saying. Does that fit with your understanding of who Jesus is? If the answer to that question is no, then you've got two basic possibilities of where to go after you have to ask yourself the question, have I misrepresented what Jesus is saying? Or does your understanding of Jesus need revisiting? The idea that Jesus would teach in such a way so that, um, so that not everybody understands um, fits with my understanding of of biblical theology in terms of who Jesus is and the nature of salvation as well. Uh, and part of that is because of the, the, the salvation doctrine that we looked at, um, what was that last year, year before? I don't remember. Um, a God who, who elects some to be saved while leaving others in their corrupted sinful state uh, seems to be perfectly in line with a Jesus who teaches so that some people don't understand. A Jesus that teaches in such a way that people don't understand is, is in line, in my view, with a God who reveals the mysteries of what is and what must soon take place to his servants, but not to the inhabitants of the earth. A Jesus who teaches in parables so that the people won't hear won't listen, won't understand, is, is in line with a God who touches one blind man and restores his sight, but doesn't just cure blindness for everybody across the board, which would be equally within his power to do. For me, this passage, this, this explanation that Jesus gives for why he teaches in parables, um, so that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they don't, do not listen, nor do they understand, um, fits with my understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is, um, because of my understanding of the nature of salvation, um, that God chooses some for salvation, but not all. With the idea that... that um, in order to be able to see the truth of the gospel, one's eyes first have to be opened by the Holy Spirit. We must be touched with the Holy Spirit, otherwise we can't see. We can hear it, we can see it, um, we can read the text, but just we just don't get it, we don't understand. Until we've been made to see, till the Spirit touches us and opens our eyes and opens our ears, and then we can see and hear. Blessed are you, Jesus says to his disciples, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear, because they've been touched by God and they can see the truth. Our... Um, the well, celebration of, of the Lord's Supper, uh, in some ways, is very parable-like. It's a story told with pictures and images, right? Um, uh, most of you, I presume, have been in church 
pretty much your whole life, or at least a significant portion of it, have celebrated the communion in probably 10 different ways over the, that time period, and um, fairly regularly. Ever stop to consider what it looks like to somebody who hasn't? I remember sitting, I remember being on vacation and sitting in the sanctuary of a church um, and uh, they were celebrating communion and, and, you know, it's vacation and we sat in the back, as you do when you're in an unfamiliar church and um, because you're not re- used to being there and you want to leave space for the other people. When you come to your regular church, you don't have to sit in the back, see? Because you know about the stuff that happens and where things are. But when you're on vacation, you sit in the back, especially when you have four boys, because to, uh, four kids, because you typically get accosted by people. Oh, we have choir on Wednesdays, and we have this, and we have that, and we have. We're just here for the week, guys. Um, but sit in the back, and it's a. Um, not my tradition in, a, in a, a sort of a closed communion, so we don't go up to participate. But you sit in the back and you watch. And just, I, I took my, I had one of those, those rare moments where, where you're just sort of outside of yourself, and I'm looking at what's happening, and the motions and the actions and everybody, you know, people reciting things in, in unison, the call and response aspects, and you know, they're, um, in terms of partaking of the communion, and they sit and they wait, and they all, you know, all the hands do this at the same time, you know, kind of a thing. And it just looks weird. It looks really weird. And it's like, man, this must be what it's like for somebody who's watching this happen, who doesn't know anything about why it's happening, or why we're doing it, who doesn't understand the significance or the meaning of it. It just looks strange. And I think that's part of the the idea, because for for those of us who whose eyes are opened and ears are 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 can hear, I mean we come to the table and we find significance and we find meaning and we find depth because of the sense of gratitude that we have. Because we see in it the, the blood of Christ shed and the body of Christ broken for us in salvation and, and we understand the cost that he paid for us and for our salvation. And we understand the meaning of that partaking these elements that we are, we are receiving him into ourselves, that we are making a statement of our faith, that we want him to live in and through us, that we derive our, our sustenance, our, lo- our living essence, our very being from our connection to Jesus Christ. And it has, can have significant impact and significant and weight because we see, because we hear. But to people who, who don't see or hear, They just don't get it. They don't understand why it's so significant. It's just bread and juice or bread and wine. And it's a tiny little bit to boot. How can that possibly be satisfying? What does that even do? It's a little parable. Jesus says, he teaches in parables, the reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to them it has not been given. And he quotes this passage from Isaiah about the people, and these are the people of God, mind you, that this passage in Isaiah is written about. That they see, they listen, but they they don't really understand. And they see, but they don't don't really perceive, and they hear, but they don't really pay attention. They don't get it. Their hearts are hard. They've shut their eyes so that they might look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. This particular passage doesn't say that God is the one who's hardening those hearts or shutting those eyes. Says so they're doing it. 
And I feel a little bit of, frankly, I feel a little bit of Jonah in this. Because this is sort of Jonah's thing, right? I don't want to go to Nineveh because if I tell them about what's going to happen, I know they're going to repent and I know they're going to, you're going to save them and I don't want you to. Because I hate them. But I get that sort, of, that sort of sense, that sort of feeling too. Think about Jesus teaching in parables so that people won't understand. This is a part of who Jesus is. It's a central, it's a core part of who he is. And if, if, uh, if we don't account for it, if we don't take it into consideration, if we don't think about how Jesus teaches as being significant to his understanding of, of what he's t- talking about, then we've missed something for sure. Jesus teaches so that some people will understand, but others won't. And blessed, he says, are you because your eyes are opened, because your ears are unstopped, because there have been prophets and righteous who have longed to see what you see and have not, and longed to hear what you hear and have not. Consider yourself blessed because you understand. And ultimately, I think for us, it's a, a statement of gratitude for us. It's not a badge of honor for us. It's something we should be grateful for and humbled by, that we have been allowed to see and to hear the truth that other people have not. And that's part of what this sacrament is about. It's the great thanksgiving in some traditions where we offer our thanks for what God has done for us. It's a very sort of reformed way of living in faith, to be grateful for what God has done, to be grateful that we can understand because it has been given to us to know the secrets of the kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have to get my liturgy. We're going to go right to communion, which is another change I should have mentioned, but didn't. Uh, there is communion liturgy in your um, bulletins. It will also be on the screen as well. Luke the Evangelist <coughs> excuse me, wrote of our risen Lord, that when he was at table with two of his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. For the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had eaten, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. We give you thanks, Lord God, our Creator, for bringing the worlds into being, for forming us in your likeness, for recalling us when we rebel against you, and for keeping the world in your steadfast love. We praise you especially for Jesus Christ, who was born of Mary and lived as one of us, who knew exactly the life we know, and yet was obedient to your purposes, even to his death on a cross. We thank you that you stamped his death with victory by raising him in power and by making him head over all things. We rejoice in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered, in its task of obedience and in the promise of eternal life. 
With the faithful in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Therefore, we bless you now by your word and spirit, both us and these gifts of bread and wine, that in receiving them at this table and in offering here our faith and praise, we may be united with Christ and one another and remain faithful to the tasks he sets before us. Brothers and sisters, the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. We invite to this table all who are members of a Christian church, who desire peace with their neighbor and who seek the mercy of God. Come, for all things are now ready. I have my helpers come up. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us give thanks. We give thanks, Almighty God.
Will you join me once again this morning in prayer? We praise and thank you, O Lord, for the nourishment we have received this morning through your word and through the sacrament of the Lord's table. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O Lord of Providence, who holds the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. God the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures and increase in us the recognition that we are all yours. O Savior God, look upon your church in its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness, bring to an end its unhappy divisions, and scatter our fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase our courage, strengthen our faith, and inspire our witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, with joy and gladness, let us present our offerings of life and labor to the Lord. You'd bring your offerings forward. Lord our God, we give you thanks indeed for the many ways in which you have blessed us. We give you thanks for the blessing of eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts and minds to know and understand. We give you thanks for the blessings of life and liberty. We give you thanks for the blessings of home and hearth and family. We give you thanks for the satisfying work that you have given us to do. Lord, we pray that these gifts which we offer in this day, will be used to glorify your name as far as 
we can reach. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our profession of faith this morning is on the back of the bulletin. It is also will be on the screen. It is responsive reading um, of Thanksgiving after communion. Uh, let us say together what we believe responsibly. Brothers and sisters, since the Lord has now fed us at his table, let us praise God's holy name with heartfelt thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquity, who redeems your life from the pit. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, as a father pities his children, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Our sending song this morning is the song, Ten Thousand Reasons. Please join together in song. Brothers and sisters, 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. One of them is that I have been given eyes to see and ears to hear the truth that Jesus has to speak, for which I am immensely grateful, for which I hope you are immensely grateful. This is what empowers our life of faith, brothers and sisters. Gratitude for what God has done. Gratitude for the gift that he has given for us even to understand what it is that he's talking about. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you gratitude. Amen. Amen.